Good evening. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. I'm Rick Bird, pastor, and uh, tonight we're going to be looking into the letter of 2 John. I want to talk to you about how truth and love go hand in hand. Before we get into our study, though, uh, let me open us with a word of prayer. Join me if you would. Father, we thank you for this time together uh, around your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to us through this uh, short letter here uh, in the end of the uh, New Testament uh, written by the Apostle John. And uh, Lord, I pray that the truth that is found in this letter, because even though it may be small, there is much to be gained from it. I pray that you will speak to our hearts and Lord, uh, may you be honored and glorified. May you, your people be blessed. And I pray that you would just speak through me for I pray it all in Jesus name. Amen. Well, take your Bible, if you will, and open it to the letter of 2 John. It's uh, all the way near the end of the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> the Apostle John wrote three letters besides his gospel, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And tonight, we're going to be looking at 2 John. In fact, we're going to look at this entire letter. We're going to begin tonight with verses 1 through 6, and then next week we'll look at the remaining uh, verses, um, verses 7 through 13. You know, one thing we hear a lot in the church today is that we should lay aside our convictions and just get along. Uh, in other words, we should not worry about our doctrinal differences or things that um, one uh, group might be sensitive to and another group might be uh, sensitive to something else. We should just put aside the things that separate us, people say, um, and just get along. We should accept one another and we should accept one another's freedom to believe the way they want. Well, I guess we should go out then and just buy those uh, t-shirts uh, that have the slogan written on them, love wins. And we just wear those to church each Sunday. Because if it's just about love, then we can just throw out God's truth. But you and I both know it's not just about love. Um, it's about truth and love. The Christian life is a life that is to be focused on God's truth and God's love. Friend, I agree we ought to love one another. I don't disagree with that at all. We ought to love people. We ought to love people in the same way that God loves us. We ought to love unconditionally. We ought to accept one another. We ought to accept one another's differences, except where our differences compromise biblical truth. But so many people uh, say that we should just get along and we should um, uh, just concentrate on the things that unite us. You know, there is far too much bickering and conflict in many churches. And if you don't believe that, just go on some of the social media sites and see the arguments the, the discussions that people get into um, over different things. Um, people argue all the time about different theological uh, stances, the different doctrinal beliefs, and things like that. And what I want to get across tonight is that, yes, we should defend the truth, and we should stand for the truth, but we should also do it in a spirit of love. And that's what's missing as well um, in our discussions today, our theological debates, our theological discussions, um, is the love that we're to have for one another. So John writes this letter, and John is not 
focusing on one over the other. He's not focused on truth to the expense of love or love to the expense of truth. No, John brings the two together in this letter. And um, I believe John is saying to us through this letter tonight, as we read this letter and as we look at it, as I'm teaching it, I believe John, the Holy Spirit is saying through John, look, you need to stand up for the truth. You need to stand by your convictions, but at the same time, do it in a spirit of love. Let's be clear. It's never okay to lay aside the truth for love. Christian love always operates in the sphere of divine truth. Both are important and neither should be neglected. As Danny Aiken, who is president of Southeastern Seminary, says, truth and love are the twin rails on which Christianity runs. They bring authenticity and balance to our Christian confession and conduct. So if you look at this letter, you see that truth and love are the thin twin themes which John is writing about. Second John is believed to have been written by John from Ephesus between AD 80 and 95, sometime after he was released from his uh, captivity on the Isle of Patmos, making it along with 3 John, the, the last New Testament books to be written. They are also the shortest. Each of these books or letters contains less than 300 words in the Greek text. The two brief letters are more like postcards. They stress the importance of divine truth. Well, at this time that John wrote this letter, the gospel had been spreading rapidly. House churches were springing up all over, and the apostolic writings were beginning to circulate. However, the apostles were all gone by this time except for John. So it made careful oversight of the church impossible. And so John is concerned that what is being taught in all of these house churches springing up and all of these gatherings, these Christian gatherings that were taking place, John is concerned that those who were teaching the believers that were gathering together, that they were teaching the truth and that the people were getting the truth and they were understanding the true gospel. At the time that these uh, churches were springing up, there were many thoughts and ideas and, um, uh, you know, in, uh, opinions as to what the gospel was about. And so John is trying to uh, have a check on some of the false uh, teaching that was taking place. At this time, some claimed new insights. Others reverted back to the Old Testament scriptures as their authority. And John was concerned that uh, how these churches would remain faithful to divine truth. Though truth is not defined here, what John means by truth, it seems that what he had in mind was the truth about Jesus Christ being God in human flesh. So John's purpose is to provide encouragement and instruction for those who care for both truth and love. Here's what I want you to take from the study this evening, and that is out of a common commitment to biblical truth, love arises for each and all in the fellowship of Christ's church. So let's look. There are two aspects of divine truth every church and every believer must consider. Tonight, we're going to look at the first aspect, which is practicing the truth. Next Wednesday night, we will look at the second aspect, that is protecting the truth. So let's look first at the 
church must practice the truth. The church, we, the church, or we as Christians, individual Christians, must practice God's truth. John says two things about practicing the truth. We are to start by loving the truth. Blaise Pascal, the brilliant Christian philosopher and mathematician, said of his day, truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we cannot know it. <clears throat> Look what John says in verses 1 through 3. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Well, John identifies himself simply as the elder. That emphasizes John's title. <clears throat> it carries, this title carries the idea of a, an aged man, an elderly man who has earned authority and respect by virtue of his experience and character. The big question is, whom is John referring to when he identifies the recipient of his letter as the elect lady and her children? Now, there are two views, common views, as to what John meant. The first uh, view stresses that a local church and its members uh, is what John meant, or the church universal. So either a local body of believers, um, it would be as if John was writing, for instance, to Cornerstone uh, Baptist Church, or the church universal. But the second uh, view is that he is literally writing to an actual lady and her children. Now, many interpreters believe that this is the best way to interpret the meaning uh, here uh, when John addresses his letter. That word elect, let's talk about that for just a minute. The word elect means to be chosen by God. So John is saying, John, the elder, the apostle, the apostle to the elect lady and her children. So when he says the elect lady, he's saying the lady and her children who have been chosen by God. This dear lady was chosen by God to be one of his holy and beloved followers. John MacArthur writes, though 2 John is a personal letter to an individual, John was writing to God's people throughout time, recognizing that all readers of his letter faced and always would face a world of lies and deceit. He wrote to call them to live in God's truth, to love within the bounds of truth, and to be loyal to and look out for the truth. So you could say that this letter, while written to this lady and her children, was also to be uh, uh, referred to uh, or shared with people uh, in churches all over, including us today. John would be writing to us, to the members of Cornerstone and to other churches. Maybe you're listening tonight. You're a member of another church. John would be including you and your church. And John would say, to you who are the elect of God, and then he proceeds to say, you need to be careful about the truth that you're hearing or not hearing, and you need to be concerned about the way you are hearing it. So John gives three reasons why the truth is important. First of all, the truth unites believers. Again, go back to verse 1. It says, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. 
John's statement, whom I love in truth, reveals his personal connection to this family. John evidently knew this family. And John is saying, to those whom I know uh, in truth, whom I love in truth. The phrase in truth explains the the sphere of John's love for them. They are united in Christian fellowship because of the truth of the gospel. Why do Christians love one another? It can't be because we are all alike, (laughs) for we know that there are many in the Christian community who are different from us. We don't all dress alike. We don't all uh, talk alike. We don't all, um, you know, do the same things. Um, We come from different backgrounds. We live uh, different ways. We have different tastes. We have different personalities. We don't all think alike. We don't dress alike. We have different friends. You see, there is much about us that is different, and that's okay. Um, The Bible never says we're to be uh, uh, in uniformity with one another. We're to be in unity with one another. So what binds the Christian community together in unity? It is a commitment to the truth regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of our common commitment to Christ, love arises Nothing draws us together as one. Nothing draws us together in unity like Jesus. That's why the truth about him is so important. Another reason why uh, the truth is important is because the truth indwells believers. Now look what John says in verse 2. He said, because of the truth, look, that abides in in us and will be with us forever. John was concerned that this lady to whom he addressed his letter might compromise the truth for the sake of hospitality. So he reminds her of the truth that indwells or abides in her. In other words, if someone comes along and knocks on this lady's door and um, he claims to be a Christian teacher or church planter, this lady, John is instructing her, should check to see if this person's teaching lines up with the truth. Friend, though we cannot comprehend the vast depth of all biblical truth. Genuine believers know the truth about Christ. We know the truth about the gospel. We know about Jesus' miraculous birth. We know about his perfect life. We know about his death on the cross. We know about his resurrection. And we know about the promise of his soon return. This eternal truth The truth of the gospel within us that abides in us must not be compromised for any reason whatsoever, no matter how well-meaning we might be. Let me make it very practical. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Let's say that you've got a friend uh, or a co-worker or maybe a family member who believes differently, who does not believe in Christ, but believes there's some other way to heaven that, um, you know, you don't have to have Christ in order to go to heaven. So when they die, they just believe that, you know, they're going to go to heaven like everybody else. And we, not wanting to offend them, not wanting to uh, hurt them in any way, uh, certainly not wanting to uh, face any criticism from them, instead of revealing the truth that Jesus claimed when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except through me, if we're not careful, we can have a tendency to compromise the revealed truth of God's word. The truth is in us. If we're Christians, the truth is in us. And John says to this lady, don't compromise 
that truth. A third reason the truth is important, not only because it unites believers, not only because it indwells believers, but thirdly, the truth blesses believers. Now look what John says in verse 3. He says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Those terms, grace, mercy, and peace, summarize salvation. Think about it like this. God's grace, which is his unmerited favor or divine kindness, caused him to grant mercy, which is compassion and pity, which results in peace or wholeness. So God's grace, his unmerited favor, caused God to grant mercy to those of us who are sinners. It, he gave us, uh, granted us compassion and pity, and the result was peace with God, meaning we have been made whole. We've been accepted by God because of God's grace and what Jesus did for us on the cross. Grace views sinners as guilty and undeserving. Mercy views them as needy and helpless. Peace is the result of God's outpouring of both and restoring us. So these divine blessings, grace, mercy, and peace, from God the Father, come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. <clears throat> and they are only present when truth and love dominate the believer's mind and heart. Friend, if you have a real love for something, it becomes the focus of your life. Do you love divine truth like you love other things in your life? <clears throat> Maybe you love baseball. It's that spring of the year. People are out going to baseball games and watching games on TV. Maybe that is one of your loves. Do you love the divine truth of God as much as you love baseball? Maybe it's your kids. Maybe you just you know, you love your kids so much, nothing is more important to you than your kids. I get that. I've got two of my own. I've got two grandsons. I love my family, but do I love my family? Do you love your family more than divine truth? You see, divine truth blesses the believer. The only real basis for unity in the church the only real basis for unity in the family is the truth of God's word that indwells and blesses individual believers. And it is only those Christians and those churches who love the truth, who teach the truth, who proclaim the truth, who live by the truth, who will be able to withstand the storms of persecution, temptation, and false doctrine that constantly try and attack them. We must love the truth. Next, we must practice the truth, not only by loving the truth, but by living the truth. We see this in verses four through six. You know, Vance Habner the old uh, evangelist from right here in Greensboro, Southern Baptist evangelist here in Greensboro, often said, what we live is what we really believe. Everything else is just so much religious talk. Jonathan Edwards said it this way, the great Puritan. He said, the informing of the understanding is all vain any further than it affects the heart. The informing of the understanding is all vain any further than it affects the heart. John agreed. John was convinced that unless truth affects the heart, it is of no value. Truth should grab hold of our head, it should grow, grab hold of our heart, and it should grab hold of our 
hands. There are two things here in verses 4 through 6 that speak to the Christian's relation to the truth. First of all, it speaks of the believer's faithful commitment. Now, John was overjoyed to see that this lady's children were firm in their commitment to the truth. Look what he says in verse 4. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Notice that phrase, walking in the truth. That refers to moving through life controlled by the gospel, controlled by the word of God. Friend, it's not enough to simply read the Bible or know scripture. I know that, you know, we, it's a big thing today, you know, to, uh, you know, challenge ourselves to read through the Bible in a year, for instance, or maybe memorize a, a, a different verse every week of the Bible. Um, uh, but it's not enough just to read the Bible, just to say you've read through the Bible. Um, uh, you know, I've read through the Bible a, a lot. But that doesn't mean that the Bible, the truth that I'm reading, has made an impact on my life. You can read something and it not make any impact uh, upon you. Nor just memorizing scripture. The important thing is whether the truth of scripture has changed our way of thinking and living. After learning the truth, do we make daily decisions and act according to the truth of God's word? Living the truth means that you see every dimension of your life in relation to your love for the truth of God's word. A good check on your decisions, on your activities, on the way you conduct yourself is to run all of your actions, all of your thoughts, all of your decisions by this book, the Bible, God's Word. Does that decision you made yesterday or that thing you did this morning, do your actions and your decisions, your way of thinking do they distract me from the truth? Do they take away my attention from what God has said in his word? Does what I'm doing or did or I'm about to do, does it violate God's word in any way? John says... We are to be firm in our commitment to the truth. Not only that, he points out the believer's foundational command in verses 5 and 6. Think of a soldier in the army. When a soldier is given an order by his commanding officer, are they given an option to whether obey that order or not? No. You know that as well as I do. Can they choose which order to obey and which to disregard? Or are they to be obedient at all times, whether they like the command, whether they understand it? Yes, we all know they are to do as their superior officer tells them to do. So when God gives us a command, does the believer, do we as believers have to obey it or do we have a choice whether to obey it or not unfortunately many Christians take the liberty of picking and choosing which of God's commands they will obey and which they will disobey the ones they will accept and the ones they will reject but this kind of behavior, friend, is not biblical. Note the command spoken by John, the command to love. John says, look what it says here in verses 5 and 6. 
And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. He says, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. And what John is simply saying to us is this, love one another. And if you're a believer, if I'm a professing believer in Jesus Christ, John says, we have no choice. I can't pick and choose the people that I decide to love. I can't love one person or one group of people and not love another or another group of people. John says, we're to love everyone. Regardless, we're to love everyone. <clears throat> this echoes what John previously wrote in 1 John chapter 2. Um, in the clearest terms, John tells us love is not an option. It's an absolute necessity. It's a way of life. This was not a new commandment, never before revealed, but it was one which believers had heard from the start of their Christian experience. It was a command actually given directly by Jesus in John 13, verses 34 and 35. Listen to what it says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Friend, the reality is Christians are called into a fellowship marked by love for all who believe the truth about Jesus Christ. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in God's sight. And they should be precious to us as well. Love is the defining mark of a true believer. And the lack of love characterizes unbelievers. So isn't it amazing that God has to command us to love one another? If you have ever raised children, you understand why. If you've ever had a boy and a girl in the same house you understand why we have to be commanded to love one another. By nature, we do not love others. But when a person receives the truth of Christ, when the person receives the love, the truth of the word of God and the gospel, the love of God dwells in his or her heart through the Holy Spirit and it enables them to love even the unlovely. So that's why truth and love are both important. Pastor Bruce Thielman told of a time when he was carrying on conversation with an older uh, Christian man um, in uh, the church. The old gentleman said to him, he said, you preachers, talk a lot about, <clears throat> talk about a lot of things. But when you get right down to it, it all comes down to basin theology. Philman asked this older gentleman, this elderly gentleman, Christian man, he said, basin theology, what is that? And the lame replied to his pastor he said remember what Pilate did when he had the chance to acquit Jesus he asked for a basin and washed his hands of the whole thing but Jesus the night before his death after his disciples had dis disappointed him <clears throat> by talking about who was to be the greatest Jesus called for a basin and proceeded to wash the feet of his disciples so he said to the pastor, it all comes down to basin theology. Which basin will you use? Will it be the basin that Pilate used to wash your hands of any um, wrongdoing? 
or will it be the basin of the Lord Jesus where you stoop and you serve another person in the name of Christ? From when it comes to loving others, you can wash your hands like Pilate did with Jesus, or you can humble yourself and love others as Jesus did with his disciples. When we love people, we obey the command of Christ. We go out in love and we say, regardless of what you have done, God loves you. I love you, therefore, because God loves you. And Jesus loved you enough that he would die for you. As a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I too love you. I am commanded to love you. But I am not just commanded to love you. It is in my heart to love you. Because when Jesus came into my life, the truth of the gospel transformed me and filled me with Christ love and I can't help but love you and I want you to know Jesus the way I do. Truth and love are what distinguish the believer from the unbeliever. Which are you? The believer who practices the truth and loves others as Jesus did? Or are you one who compromises the truth and chooses to love certain people but not others? John wants us to understand not enough just to know what the Bible says, not enough just to know the gospel. We must know the truth. We must practice the truth and we must love one another. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your love. God, may your truth truly abide in us, and may we be channels of your love to those around us. We do love you, we praise you. We thank you again for ministering to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. For we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friend. Hope to see you Sunday here in church. If not, tune in again, live stream, and hear our worship services. Mm -hmm.